Science, writing and communication is as important today as it ever has been, with COVID-19, climate change and many other global issues demanding daily coverage in the news and longer form coverage as well. Cosmos was lucky enough to have journalist and editor of the Best Australian Science Writing 2021, Diani Lewis, join featured writers Ella Lofer, Dr Jackson Ryan and Bianca Negrady for a chat about what science journalism means to them, what they'll be writing about next, and the writers that inspire them. Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us for this Cosmos briefing. My name's Diani Lewis, and I'm joining you all today from the land of the Yellowcoat Willem clan of the Bunurong people. And I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and also to the traditional owners and elders from wherever it is that you might be joining us from today. Now, I've had the privilege this year of being the editor for the Best Australian Science Writing 2021, and this anthology is now in its 11th year. I'm a scientist turned freelance science journalist based in Melbourne, and I've been a contributor to Cosmos magazine since 2012, and I also write for a bunch of other outlets, both here and overseas. But today I'm here to pick the brains of three of the contributors to uh, this year's anthology. Their pieces were selected from over 340 entries into, uh, to be put into the anthology. Uh, so these are really some of the best examples of science writing out there. We've got Bianca Negrady, who is a fellow science, uh, freelance science writer and broadcaster. She's also the two-time editor of Best Australian Science Writing. She's written books on death and climate change, and she's been published in The Atlantic and Wired UK and loads of other places. And she's also the founding president of the Science Journalists Association of Australia. Welcome, Bianca. Thank you so much. Nice to be right. here. <laughs> we also have Ella Loeffler, a conservation ecologist who has a passion for wildlife and for storytelling. She's putting her degrees in both zoology and literature to great use working in conservation policy at the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Welcome, Ella. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. And finally, we've got Jackson Ryan, who was a runner up in this year's UNSW Bragg Prize in Science Writing, which celebrates the best of the best in the anthology each year. Jackson is the science editor at CNET.com. And in a past life, he put his PhD to work in a lab. And he also fronted a kids science TV show. Good to have you here, Jackson. Thank you so much. Thanks. Nice to be here. And nice to see all your smiling faces. <laughs> yeah. Bianca, I'll start with you. You wrote a, an intriguing article called Cracking the Meat Allergy Mystery with a Tick Bite Bite Link. And you wrote that piece for Nature. It was awarded the third place in the US-based Association of Healthcare Journalists Awards for Excellence in Healthcare Journalism in 2021. So it's a fabulous piece. And you know, everyone's very familiar with peanut allergies and egg allergies and meat and, and milk allergies, but where on earth did you find this story about meat allergies? Well, this is one of those serendipitous discoveries where um, I think it was back in 2007 or 2006. It's been so long ago, I can't remember exactly. Um, and we had a friend over for dinner when we were living down in Sydney and he said, yep, that's fine, just can't have any meat. And I remember kind of, you know, and then I was like, oh, you vegetarians and no, I'm allergic to it. And I remember just having this thought, how can you be allergic to meat? We're made of meat. How does that even work? And so he was the one that first said, well, actually, um, it's this, uh, there's this whole thing around tick bites and red meat allergy. And it's, a, it's apparently a feature in Sydney's northern beaches. It's only clustered around the northern beaches. And he said, you should talk to my allergist immunologist, which was um, uh, uh, Professor Sher Cheryl Van Noonan. And it just was sort of one of those really weird things. I just thought this... This, this sounds like a really interesting story to pursue. And it's fine. I've been following it ever since then. I've kind of seemed to write about it every few years, something new pops up or, um, you know, in this case, it was that nature was doing a supplement on food allergies. And, you know, and I, they said, oh, have you got any ideas? I'm like, well, <laughs> have I ever? Um, and it's just, it's been fascinating to watch this story evolve because when I first started writing about it, as far as I know, I was one of the first journalists to report on it. And at the time, 
it was just something that I thought was an Australian story that Cheryl Van Noonan had made the connection with this tick bites, but hadn't yet worked out what was the mediating factor between the tick bite and the development of the meat allergy. And then as it kind of the story progressed and it turned out that no, this isn't just an Australian phenomenon that it emerges in, has emerged in these other parts of the world and particularly in the US as well. Um, and there they'd worked out what the mediating factor was, but they hadn't made the connection to the tick. Uh, so the mediating factor was this protein, the alpha-gal protein. And so it was, it was sort of watching this science story evolve in front of me where these two kind of completely unconnected groups um, by some, it was some fortuitous connection, like a conference poster or something where the penny dropped and they realized they were basically both working on the same sort of two sides of the same coin. And, and since then, this has just exploded. Like this has become a massive health issue in certain parts of the US. Um, it's also present in Japan, in Europe, in um, parts of Africa. It's kind of everywhere. And it's always, you know, alpha gal seems to be this, the key ingredient. And then the, the, the kind of, um, I guess the source of that alpha gal then is some kind of an insect bite. So there's the sensitizing event. There's the, the, sen the kind of, the thing that people get sensitized to and then this alpha gal protein is found in mammalian meat but not in primates and so that's why humans we don't have it and so if we become sensitized to it and then are exposed to it by eating meat then well, some people not every people then you get this um sometimes really severe allergic reaction so it just it just has everything in it it's like zoology it's it's biology it's allergy it's immunology it's insect stuff it's vi uh, like vector biology it's just the coolest story I, I love it I'll be following it for a long time yet I hope and so Jackson your story didn't take you to lots and lots of different research groups pulling different pieces of the puzzle together you your story uh on the quest to grab a piece of asteroid um uh from the Ryugu um, asteroid that was really following one group really intently how did you go about you know approaching the Japanese space agency and getting that ex access that you needed to tell such a great story uh thank you for those nice comments I think the uh and that was awesome by the way Bianca I was looking at your wall as well it's like is there a tick behind you on, on that wall in your <laughs> insect frame is it no those are bees okay. Okay, <laughs> there is a skull right. and lots of bees which I guess is you know, <laughs> loosely connected okay um uh, as for the the Ryugu story um I knew that uh the mission was ending in in December 2020 and that it would be uh, landing in the Australian outback. So I knew in South Australia and I'm from South Australia. I live in Sydney now. And honestly, the very first thing I thought was like, oh, this would be a good way to go home sort of around, Christ <laughs> around, around Christmas time. But there was also, a, um, there's always, I, I've followed the story for a, quite some time. Um, I'm, we write a lot about uh, space at CNET. Um, and I think one of the major things was like, I was drawn to the idea that JAXA are doing this like really quite incredible thing. Um, grabbing pieces of an asteroid from far beyond uh, Earth's orbit and being like, bringing that, bringing that piece home, but not really getting too much mainstream media play about it. And what really solidified the idea was, I guess, NASA are doing the same thing now with a, a spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx, and they visited a, uh, an asteroid called Bennu, very similar asteroid. And I remember it was like this big splash on the New York Times when it happened um, that they they pulled these um, pieces of the asteroid. And yes, New York Times covered Ryugu as well back in 2018, but it just didn't feel as important for some reason. And so when I knew it was going, you know, to my home state, I uh, I basically was like, okay, how can I cover this and be on the ground? And like, what would that even mean? What would that look like? Clearly, there was a pandemic going on. Um, so I just reached out to uh, one of the authors actually on a, on a Ryugu paper. And said, "Hey, you know, I'm really interested in this story and, and the science of like grabbing this and bringing it home." And, mm. uh, and they put me through to Jack Sarah, and I ended up talking to Masaki Fujimoto, who is the uh, deputy director of one of their um, subdivisions, ISIS. And we just kind of hit it off via email very quickly. He was very personable. He was going to come down to South Australia, and I said to him, "This is what I want to do." Um, and he said okay, I can give you like these 20 interviews, these 20 scientists or whatever. And straight away, I was like, oh, this is going to be a huge like story because not a lot of people have access to JAXA. And it was actually something that it was, 
it was always serendipitous, I think, when we were writing. But in some ways, it was like the perfect timing for JAXA, who also wanted to open up their English communication channels. This mission in particular was like um, sort of the first mission where a lot of the live streams and stuff are broadcast um, in English as well as Japanese. And that's owing to people like um, uh, Elizabeth Tasker there who was basically an English liaison for the media side and so they had wanted to expand their outreach and I came along at the right time and um, I think that's really where it grew from and getting close to the people made it a much more human story for me as well and writing writing about it and just kind of realizing their hopes and their dreams for this mission and how complicated it was because of the pandemic and then once I got to meet them in person it was like it was clear that um, all that kind of legwork, the six, eight months of legwork of like talking to them and Zooming with them. And, you know, these aren't people that can speak English naturally. That's not their native language. So there's like a, a big barrier there and being able to work through all that and then getting to meet them. It was like, this is a, a very, it's a story of human triumph. And it's one that I don't think would get told if I don't tell it. So um, yeah, I was fortunate enough yeah. to be able to tell it. Yeah, yeah. And those characters really do come through. And uh, Ella, in your in your piece, you've got an intensely personal uh, story under the shade of the eucalypt. And in that, I guess there are probably two characters. There's the character of the Australian wildlife and uh, Australian nature and ecosystems, and then your own character. Uh, how does that personal story, I guess, enrich what you're trying to convey about um, about science or about nature? That's a good question. Um, I think for me, in writing the story, I, I didn't. I sat down to write something and didn't, didn't have any idea what I was going to put down. But um, it kind of en ended up being um, the story of how I fell in love with the different things that I love to do, um, and a big part of that is, um, you know, being a part of the nature around me, like you said. Um, and I think that often, but maybe the vehicle for seeing that, of understanding that for me has been storytelling or, you know, trying to interpret that in different ways. Um, you know, I grew up with mum, my mum's a doctor and a writer. So I was always, I was told to be anything but a doctor. I wasn't allowed to be a doctor <laughs> for most people. She said, absolutely not. Don't go into medicine. It's that. Um, but I was always told to follow what I love. And I think for me, it's sort of an early career, um, you know, you guys are all very acclaimed and very impressive. And, um, you know, I'm still sort of a, a bit early in my career, but I think um, for me telling that story of how I've fallen in love with what I do and um, I think, like, I think what I love about nature is seeing the little things. Um, and I, think I kind of try, tried to portray that a bit in the story. Yeah. Um, you know, even during lockdown, um, I've, I've always loved, you know, animals but never been hugely into birds. And then during lockdown, I suddenly was like, crap, I've got nothing to do. And I started noticing the birds really closely. And I'd go down to my local park and became an obsessive bird watcher. Um, and, and it really saved me the past two years, um, you know, being able to go out and, and have that kind of it's a sort of form of meditation for me being out in nature. I think yeah. Um, it just, yeah, it brings out, it, I'm just, yeah, it's just what I love and um, having that focus on something. And then what is it that, I guess, uh, compels you as a working scientist and as a, you know, nature lover um, to write about those experiences for other people? Or are you just a, is it in your blood? Are you a writer in your bones? Um, no, I actually, I have to work for it. Like, I think I've got, got things to say, but I have to force myself to sit down and, you know, I'm so used to in my work, in my, you know, academic career, whatever, reading science papers and just you know very to the point um and even when I was doing my degree you know I'd walk into my science classes and it's like write it in as few words as possible and be succinct and get to the point and then in literature it's like oh well, what does this word mean let's spend an hour talking about that um so I think I think I always found it interesting kind of the two sides of my brain or the, the two things that I love um bringing those together and I think I think yeah you know writing about science is the best way to draw people in and you know, it's all good and well that I love it, but um, I want I, I want to share that love, and I want I want other people to share that. And I think I think it, you know I've seen, like I was saying that you know bird watching was so good during the pandemic. I think a lot of people have found that that nature to be that like 
you know, reprieve um, during the past couple of years when everything's been a bit difficult. Yes, and I, I think everyone, especially those out there who are perhaps thinking of a career in science writing, it's really reassuring to have you say that. Like, no, we all we all have to work for work for it. Really, I don't. I think um, uh, you know, being a writer is you know hard work, and it's not something that is just a spark of inspiration that is limited to a few lucky individuals. Um, it, it's it's uh, yeah, great to hear that, but. Um, Jackson, you also had a, a brief career on TV and Bianca, you, you're a broadcaster as well. Um, Jackson, are there, you know, there are some really, really well-known um, uh, radio shows and podcasts and TV shows that cover science. Is it, is it hard for writing to compete with these visual um, auditory uh, formats you know how do you make your writing compelling so that it really grabs people uh, very tough question for me Diane uh, I think I think uh, the major thing for me like having worked in tv it's really not about I don't think it's like a tv versus writing kind of question I actually think like our attention spans are way different now than they've ever been. So the idea that someone can go on TikTok and within 15 seconds, they've learned that there's a new planet that they've, we've just found or that snake slither up a pole in a certain way or whatever it might be um, has like reduced our uh, capacity to like sit down and really read through long form journalism. So uh, for me, and I, I know it's the same for a lot of science journalists. I know like long form is kind of like, a peak in some way. We talked about this recently with the Science Journalists Association of like long form being um, kind of where everyone aspires to go. And what long form gives you the opportunity to do is to dive into the details a bit more and really tell a story. So with, with To the Dragon Palace and back, I think I was always thinking about how to tell the best story. I was plotting out the story. I was thinking about the ways to really dive into each section and what that would look like. And there's an element where if you, I guess, if you look at TV or if you look at TikTok or even Twitter or whatever it might be, those platforms, uh, you need to really hit people with whatever it is you want to say in the first 8, 10, 15 seconds, whatever it might be. So I think if you have to do that, um, it, it does, that is the hard part. How do you make uh, 6,000 words compelling over 15 seconds? Um, what I tried to do, I guess, in my story was like incorporate a lot of culture, incorporate a lot of human elements, incorporate things that people could hold on to. And it also also incorporate really good art. And I think um, that's part of the, the challenge sometimes with digital journalism, particularly is like, how does it look on the page? There's always a lot of white space. There's all that, that sort of thing as well. So, um, yeah, I think that that's the way that I tried to make it compelling. And you can kind of tell when you're researching the story what the compelling elements are going to be for other people I think at least in the in the best stories the ones that come naturally I think end up being your best stories because you can kind of tell wow that resonated with me this will resonate with other people um so yeah it's very it's very hard uh, is the answer how do you make something compelling when we have this deluge of content every single day um to compete with it's hard um and you have to work for it yeah and Bianca I guess there's also this other uh, function of science writing which isn't just to compel and entertain and draw people into your writing but um, you need to inform people give people the technical details about alpha gal um, for instance um, are there you know what do you have I guess front of mind for you know um, ticking off the functions of, of what your pieces need to do. Are there, are there things that you sort of really have to, um, you know, focus on to, you know, make sure it's accessible, make sure it's not um, creating doubt in an era where there's so much fake news, for instance? I mean, um, yeah, what, what, how do you approach a piece? I guess, yes, yeah, really what Jackson was saying about storytelling, I, I think, at the heart of it, we are, we're telling a story and it's working out what bits of this are, are important to the story and what bits is, are, you know, um, interesting but maybe not essential to the story. And, and 
you know, and I think this is also where good editing comes in is that, you know, like I think Jackson, you mentioned a while back, your piece was originally like 11,000 words or something yeah. insane. And I know I could have written this tick one twice as long. There's so much more. And I, I've had so many pieces like that where, you know, you just dive so deep into the subject matter and there are so many different, you know, little kind of aspects to the story that you, it's like, oh, but that's so interesting. I want to include that and I want to include that. And, but, you know, I guess word count is a very good frame that kind of you hold up and you kind of have to cut everything off that doesn't fit in the frame. And so all of those lovely little tidbits end up on the cutting room floor. But actually I was listening to a podcast recently about um, somebody talking about kind of long form work and, and as a freelancer and how they make that work. And it was that notion that you have the main story, but then you also, you know, all the stuff that ends up on the cutting room floor. It's like, well, what can you make of that? Like, what are those, what can you do with those bits and pieces? But so in terms of, I guess, the science for this one, it's really just what's interesting. You know, this wasn't a case where there was actually, it, it actually wasn't a really technical piece. Like, you know, I think when you start getting to some areas like immunology, it can get really technical. But this one was actually surprisingly, it, it is actually relatively simple. I didn't really go right into the deep dive of the immunology of it. A little bit, you know, there was a few IgGs and IgEs thrown around, but um, it wasn't, it, it wasn't too hard and really what, so it, it meant that I could just focus on the, the process. I mean, really it's telling the story of how science is and scientists are slowly kind of piecing together this, you know, what is essentially an allergy, a food allergy in a Petri dish. You know, there is no other allergy you get where they, you know, it, it we know why it starts, you know, what is it that's the trigger for this allergy to develop? there's no other allergy like that. Like you have people who have the first event, but then you don't know what is it that sensitized them to this particular thing in the first place. Whereas this, we know exactly what the sensitizing event was, which is the tick bite. So then it's like, well, what is it about the tick bite? And then you get into well, what is it about ticks? And then you get into, you know, there's the, the kind of the climate aspect as well as that the distribution of these ticks is changing. And, and also maybe the reason that ticks are producing alpha gal, which they don't need to produce, is because it's a response to environmental pressures and changes in the environment. So, it, but it, it was complex, but it wasn't uh, difficult to convey. Whereas, you know, there are some other stories where, yeah, you kind of go a bit cross eyed, like you're trying to write something at the moment about um, uh, neutrinos and. Uh, Ghost you know. particles, ghost particles works every time. Oh. Every time. <laughs> it's I mean, so if, hard. I, if I could add a little bit to what you were kind of saying there, Bianca, um, just about the editing, it's like something I've done a lot more in the recent in recent months is like I, I, we got another science writer, which is so awesome. And then editing someone else's work actually sharpens up your work a lot too. I think I, that I've mm -hmm. definitely found that. But one of the things is also, you know, with I, I know who said it best, but he's he he who shall not be named. Um, no, Mr. Ed Yong, who everyone talks about all the time, is the, the bastion of, of science journalism or whatever it might be. Um, great writer. The idea of like having um, science journalism or science writing and what is that? What distinguishes it from other writing is actually getting harder and harder to do, specifically with the pandemic, but with other topics as well. And I think for me, um, there's one kind of maxim I've always sort of subscribe to it, it's the idea of having the courage to digress and so you can have a story and you can plot it out and it will look like a traditional story that has no kind of um i guess real science journalism or science writing aspects to it but you can take that time to almost pull the reader out for just a couple of seconds and say look this is what this thing is and this is what's going i tried to do that in dragon palace by pulling out and looking at the folk, folk tale the japanese folk tale <laughs> which forms a large part of the story and saying like this is this is how you can connect with this if you want. Um, not so much the science as a section before that and a section after that, that's a little bit more um, dense and it little, was very confusing for me to try and get my head around. But being able to pull people out, having the courage to digress is something that I, I read in a book a long time ago. In fact, it's probably somewhere here. I don't know which book it is, but whoever said that, thank you. Um, and that's something that I subscribe to now in, in um, trying to convey something from a science journalism perspective. And something that I think science journalists do really well is being able to pull the reader out and say, here's the science. Okay, back to the story. Can I also just add something to that as well? It's also that notion of well, what is the what's the, the evidence say? You know, with, with science journalism, it's like, okay, well, we've got this single study, but then what's all of the other stuff around it? And not every piece of every piece of science journalism or science writing 
needs to do that. But, you know, it is also sometimes really, really important to make sure that, um, you know, that, that you do actually represent what is the lay of the land from an evidence perspective. It, you know, it's not just taking a single study and then portraying this as some kind of truth when in fact there's 99 studies that have, you know, demonstrated completely contradictory results to that one study. It's understanding what is the scientific lay of the land on this particular issue. And that, that's a lot of the background, I think, that goes into science writing. And Ella, your piece is almost, it's almost like a love letter to Australia, to Australian wilderness and its creatures. Is it important, do you think, that Australia has its own science journalists and writers to write the stories of Australia? I mean, do Australian writers or Australian journalists um, have, a, have something to add on the international stage that perhaps a, a, a visitor to the country might not, um, might not, uh, be able to provide. Yeah, definitely. I think so. I think, you know, um, an understanding of place is so much more than just rocking up to somewhere. Um, I think that we live in such an incredible country with such beautiful opportunities to explore and be a part of nature. Um, and I think that we, you know, we can tell it as, as having a lived experience in this country, um, we can share that so much better. Um, I think also a point that I try to make in my essay is that, you know, we have First Nations people who've been in this country for millennia and, you know, more so than any of us have such an incredible connection with country and um, those voices I think are so important to amplify, which I think is something that I, I try and support in, in the work that I do as well. Yeah, I, I think that writing and, sh and sharing our perspective on things is, is such a good way of encouraging, especially in the, in the context of the environment, um, encouraging people to um, take on that stewardship and, and that, uh, you know, your passion for something, and uh, in particular the environment, can be uh, such a strong voice for creating change. And I think, it, you know, it's said so often, but people aren't going to make change if they don't care. Um, and, you know, writing your voice and sharing what, you know, I, I think you're right in saying it was a love letter to, to Australia and to, and to nature. Um, and I think for me, sharing that love is trying to bring people in and, and you know, think how, how can we protect that and be stewards of that for the future. Yeah, I think yeah. there's an element of like in, in sorry, Dion, I think there's, there's something really cool about like to plug the previous edition of this uh, Best Train Science Writing 2020. The story I wrote that was fortunate enough to be in that edition about um, conservation and about um, sort of our wildlife, Australian wildlife. And there's a being able to dive into that there's a real we have a real unique viewpoint in this country I think not only like a, a good one in terms of like oh we've got this amazing bi biodiversity but also like a bad one in that we're killing all these animals much faster than some other places in the world so um, there's an element I guess um, from Australian science journalist perspective that we live in that and we hear about that and we understand that especially around the fires of course um, uh, the bushfires and so I think yeah, the question you asked Ellen, Ella answered very eloquently is that that, that is the idea of being able to speak to that and our own experiences, lived experiences is, is very important, as well as, of course, Indigenous um, uh, cultures who have a much deeper connection to the land. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whose writing should we all be reading? Jackson, you've mentioned Ed Yong. Uh, Ella, do you have any go-to people who have inspired you um, in, in your writing or who you particularly enjoy reading? Oh, so many. I'm actually a sucker for fiction. I, <laughs> it's my, <laughs> that's what I love to read. Um, but I did just read, so, so Anthony Doer, his new book, he wrote, um, well, All the Light We Cannot See, and he's got a new book that's just come out, Cloud Cuckoo Land, which is fiction, but it's this incredible 600-page saga uh, about what our place is on this earth across you know his his writing is across hundreds of years different stories and um, about environmental stewardship and what it means to be human um in this mm. time and it, it was just I couldn't put it down it was just astonishing so I think I love writing that mixes you know when we talk science writing I think it doesn't have to be limited to non-fiction I think there's um some beautiful fiction works out there as well which I really love yeah yeah sure and what about you Bianca do you have go-to people who inspire you? 
Oh, look, I have to say Joe Chandler is probably one of the writers that I, you know, when I read her work, it's like, I want to write like that. <laughs> you know, I just, I love that she, there's so much kind of scene and colour and movement and, um, and, and her in there as well, like particularly the piece that's in this anthology, you know, it's just, you could just you can feel her just her soul in that piece and her anguish in that piece um but everything she writes i just yeah i just find absolutely magical and like Caridwen uh Caridwen Dovey as well i think is a beautiful writer rebecca giggs i love her um her writing um i'd like to read more that's the problem i actually don't read a lot of nonfiction <laughs> because i just spend so much time writing it that when I read everything I read is fiction is is well mostly science fiction actually and so I you know I um I kind of I, I mean I love it's so nerdy but I love Dune and I love Contact they're like my two all-time all-time favorite books and I've reread re them so many times and um but yeah obviously they're pretty kind of old white blokes writing science fiction and I'm now rediscovering not discovering rediscovering discovering science fiction written by women and by women of colour and that's a real awakening of actually um, just broadening my reading horizons but I don't know every anthology I read through it and just go oh there's just so many ridiculously <laughs> talented people and you know I, and I remember editing it just the first you know the first time I edited it it was just like this uh, yeah again awakening of okay I need to pick up my game <laughs> You know, this this is really good stuff, and realizing just how good science writing is in Australia, um, it was it was a, a real motivator, actually. Yeah. And what's on the horizon then, in terms of of writing? What what pieces need to be told? What pieces are you going to be telling? I'll, I'll ask each of you, maybe Bianca. Well, I actually did just pitch a story about how zoos are dealing with climate change, which may or may not get over the line, but I've been wanting to write it for years. And I really hope it, it's one of those, this is one of those long form pieces that I've, you know, it's like, this is such a fabulous story and I just, I, I'm desperate to make it happen. Um, <laughs> so that's sort of something. And I, I you know, I want to write about, I mean, obviously climate change is a, is a huge thing. It is kind of the topic. I mean, the pandemic has been big, but you know, climate change is bigger in some respects and, um, or in all respects. And yeah, I, I, there are so many stories I want to write, just trying to understand what is this future going to look like? You know, for example, having been uh, unpleasantly close to the bushfires in 2019, 2020, you know, I, I want to, to explore where do we live in this country? You know, we're caught between drought, fires, sea level rise. Um, where do we live and what does the you know Australia's kind of future um, occupation I guess look like so yeah lots of ideas I have I have no shortage of ideas it's just finding time and outlets really yeah Jackson what, what, what are you working on <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, the anchor's probably right on the money, like climate change is the thing. Um, the last couple of weeks, uh, we're recording this during COP26, of course, and the last couple of weeks, we're very focused on um, technologies that obviously won't solve the climate crisis, but might help adapt or mitigate um, some of its effects. Um, rapid decarbonisation is the only thing that we can really do to prevent um, warming um, to the levels that we agree to, we our government's agreed to in the Paris Agreement. Um, climate change is going to be a big thing for me, I guess, over the next year. It was meant to be a big thing in 2020, January 2020. Um, of course, on January 19, I think we published our first COVID explainer and uh, it didn't stop for a long time. Somehow I was able to write a, a bigger story in between that, which is the, the nice thing about having a job at CNET.com, a great website, by the way. And <laughs> <laughs> just like Cosmos. Um, but yeah, I think... For me, climate will be probably number one. Um, I've got some cool opportunities coming up um, towards the end of the year that, uh, you know, might come off, might not come off, can't say too much, but i um, hoping for some big things. And also, uh, I guess outside of writing, um, the biggest thing is getting science and environmental journalism uh, recognised at the Walkleys, something that Bianca and Diana yourself are probably involved in. I, there's a hashtag of some description here, science yeah, at the Walkleys or something. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll work that out eventually. But... Um, 
uh, yeah, I think that, that those are the kind of bigger goals. Gr- growing long-form journalism in Australia somehow um, is something that I really want, want to try and achieve. So uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we can do so. Um, if there's people listening who have heaps of money, hello, hello, <laughs> let's go. Look me um, up. <laughs> I, I, you didn't ask me about the books I like because I did mention Ed Young. Yes. But one thing I just want to say, uh, Diani, as the host, is also a very accomplished science writer, as people who read Cosmos would know. <laughs> um, and I think it's important to note that many of uh, the science journalists in Australia, you know, we kind of have a, a small group of people who um, share each other's work. And to me, uh, some of the most, uh, genuinely some of the most inspiring stuff is someone sharing that work and being like, hey, this is a thing I wrote, because it's just so cool to get it out of the land and know what other people in the country are doing. Um, so yeah, I think uh, anyone who's listening should definitely go check out obviously this book, which has a lot of great science writers, but um, jump on Twitter. Um, there's plenty, plenty of um, Australian science writers doing really great work across science, health, environment, all those kind of areas too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'll come back to you, Ella. Are there, are there any stories that you're working on or are there stories that you think have been completely overlooked that really need to be dug into what what what's on your horizon I don't know I'm always living in my little conservation bubble um and come across so many incredible stories of people across Australia just doing fantastic work trying to you know do something to save our amazing species um I don't know what it, what it'll look like yet but I feel like I'm every time I have a meeting or a conversation with someone I'm collecting the little stories of um you know incredible projects uh Recently, you know, an example is recently, I, I did my honours a few years back on a little critter called the Eastern Bar Bandicoot, which is in my story. Um, and they recently, the species uh, was downgraded to endangered thanks to a 30 year program of incredible people that work tirelessly to, to save the species. And that's kind of the first of its kind of, um, you know, the spe- it was extinct in the wild and, and came back, bounced back um, and now is endangered, which is still not great, but better than what it was before. Um, and there's just so many incredible stories like that across the conservation sector. Um, so would love one day to do, to write something about that. Well, fabulous. Well, thank you all for your insights into your writing lives and your, uh, your journalism lives. And um, thank you also to Gail McCallum and Ian Canellan, the editors of Cosmos. Uh, the Best Australian Science Writing 2021 is available now in all good bookstores. <laughs> um, and uh, thanks for joining us.